Uh, hi everyone, this is a uh, unit eight team. Um, my name is Kamil Zalewski and today I'll have the uh, pleasure of hosting the, uh, the unit eight webinars. Uh, unit eight uh, talks is our webinar series on, on data and AI where we're trying to share our best practices and our knowledge in the, in the area. Uh, all of the recordings of the past sessions can be found on YouTube. Um, today, the, the session for today is, uh, is around time series forecasting. And I have two presenters from uh, from Unit 8, uh, Francesco and Leo, who are going to be covering the, the topic. Uh, without any further uh, review, uh, enjoy the session, and I give the floor to Francesco. All right, thanks, Camille. So welcome to this introduction to DARTS, our uh, time series processing and forecasting library. Um, before we actually start with DARTS, I'd like to say a few words about time series and why they are important. So why do we care about time series? Well, essentially because they're everywhere. A time series is uh, nothing else but a series of data points that are indexed in chronological order. And we care about time series forecasting because it is useful in many applications to be able to predict the future. And there are countless examples in business of where this could be useful. And just to give a couple examples, um, suppose you're an energy production company. So energy doesn't store well. And booting up a power plant isn't as easy as simply flicking on a switch. So you'd like to be able to predict the demand into the future in order to be able to produce the exact right amount of energy at the right time. Uh, another example would be uh, inventory stock prediction. So suppose you're a car manufacturer. To build a specific model, you need to have different parts in your inventory. And on the one hand, you want to have enough parts available to not have to wait for them. But on the other hand, stockpiling a large amount of car parts costs a lot of money. So being able to forecast your inventory and the demand uh, can be extremely valuable and can save you a lot of money in the long run. And of course, there are countless uh, more applications like that, um, but I think you get the idea. So let me introduce Darts by talking about the what, the why, and the how. So let's start with the what. What is Darts? So Darts is an attempt to streamline time series processing and forecasting in Python. And as you can see on this diagram, in the first box, we have tools to inspect time series, to learn things about them through statistics and visualizations. So this is, these are kind of our discovery tools. Then we have uh, means to process time series, such as normalization, interpolations, trend and seasonality removals, and so on. All of these tools can help you prepare your time series data for what is often the next step, which is forecasting. And here we provide a wide range of models, and we will talk much more about this uh, later. And finally, we provide functionality such as backtesting and grid search to let the user select the best model out of a growing range of possibilities. And actually, as the project developed, uh, we put particular emphasis on the forecasting part and all the functionalities that go along with it. Now let's talk about why Darts. So why are we developing an open source library in the first place? So we at Unit 8 strongly believe that IT solutions should be universally accessible as opposed to being only available for the privileged few to use. And Darts is open source. This means that anyone can use it. Anyone can look at how it works and anyone can adapt it to their own needs. So this is a project very much in line with our philosophy. But um, why time series processing and forecasting in particular? So I told you about the need for uh, time series and forecasting in general, but why develop a Python library for this? So actually, this is an area of technology that we ourselves are involved in quite frequently. And in the past, we've often ran into the problem of having to kind of scramble together time series processing and forecasting utilities from different Python libraries to integrate forecasting into our existing projects. So while doing that, we noticed a distinct lack of a unified library for time series forecasting in Python, as opposed to 
other programming languages such as R that have a, a kind of more developed ecosystem for that. So this provided us with the initial motivation to develop darts, namely uh, to fill this void. And then of course, you know, even though making technology more accessible is very much one of our goals, we also created this library for ourselves. And in fact, we have already used it in several of our projects. Now let's talk about the how of darts. And I'd like to quickly say a few words about how did darts come about. So the project actually dates back to uh, mid 2018 when Julia, one of our team members, had the idea for this library. And for a long time, this project was only progressing in short bursts of activity. Uh, but starting in 2020, we started to take it more seriously. And basically last summer, we had our first release, uh, Dart 0.1.0. And since then, a lot of things have happened. And I'd like to quickly go over some of the stats relating to what happened between uh, that first release and where we are today, which is uh, Dart version 0.5.0. So basically, um, we have gotten a bunch of GitHub stars, uh, which kind of showed us that there is indeed a demand for this kind of library, and users seem to like it. And we also have many forks, so users seem to be adapting this library to their own needs, and some of them are also contributing, and we have, uh, uh, at this point, four outside contributors that have actually contributed code to the main release of Darts, so people outside of Unit 8. And um, we've also had kind of darts being applied um, in web apps. We've, we've had one user on LinkedIn develop a web app uh, that does forecasting, which uses darts in the back end. And this actually kind of inspired us to do something similar. So um, if, if you're interested in that, stay tuned. I guess follow us on LinkedIn um, because um, that's going to be interesting. So, all right. So. That was it for the uh, introduction, and now I'd like to give the word to Leo to give you a overview of the Darts library. Thanks, Francesco. So now this is a tech talk, so we're going to be going into exactly how Darts uh, can help you and how you would use it. The overview, just to let you know where we're going, um, we're going to be first looking at time series, the time series object, uh, which is the main abstraction our library provides with forecasting models. So looking at a couple things we can do with time series, then we'll be looking at forecasting models. As I said, how we would create, train a model, use it to forecast. Then we'll be looking at evaluating a model. This is actually in practice what you'll wanna be able to do very accurately and we provide a very easy way to do so. So we'll be looking at metrics and to big methods that are historical forecast and backtest. So those two. We'll have a quick look at grid search, which as the name suggests, helps you find and tune your models, find the best hyperparameters. And finally, heading back to Francesco, he'll present to you uh, this nice ensemble model class that we have and he'll explain to you all that it means and finally some data processing abilities built in in darts as well so without further ado we'll get started um, this is going to be our example today it's a toy data set that represent milk production so as i said not super insightful but we're going to be using it to showcase um, what darts can do and obviously the goal is what you see here on the right, so to have a forecast that is very accurate. Obviously here, since we only have training and validation set and no test set, we will overfit our model to, to get it, but still it's going to be useful to give you an example uh, of how you would forecast, backtest, grid search with Dart. So getting started, the time series object, as I said, is the main abstraction darts provide the nicest part about darts i'd say and you can build it super easily from a data frame a pandas data frame so you just create your data frame and then call time series from data frame pass the data frame pass the column in your data frame that you want to use as a time index it's a time series so it has a time index and then you can pass one or more columns that you're going to use as values so darts has support for both 
univariate and multivariate time series. This is going to be a univariate example for simplicity's sake, but you could pass more than a single column here if you have more. Then, um, going on, you'll go on to split your series into training and validation sets. This can be done super easily with Dart, so basically just call split before, give it a pen as timestamp, and you're going to get back, it's going to return training and validation sets. Uh, not shown here, but obviously the plots I'm getting on the right are also super easy to get. You simply call plot on your time series object. So here calling training dot plot, giving it a label, you'll, you'll get, you'll get the, the plots on the right. So that's it for the time series object. Obviously there are a lot more methods on time series object we have implemented. You could apply map transformations, do all kinds of splits, uh, that kind of stuff. The underlying representation is a pandas data frame. So even if we don't have it right now, you could find your way around using some pandas uh, data frame methods if you really need them. Then moving on to forecasting, uh, the goal behind darts, the main idea behind darts is to create a library that allows you to perform simple forecasts super easily. And so this is what it, this is what it shows here you simply have to import the right model, the model you want to use from our darts model package and then uh, module, and then you simply create it, instantiate it, call fit, give it the training set. So this is going to train your model and then call model predict and give the length, the number of points into the future you want to predict. And you're going to get back a forecast, which is in itself a time series. So again, plotting this on the right is just a couple three calls to plot and you're going to get this. Um, another example, if you want to use another model, it just, you can simply swap exponential smoothing for theta or other models. They all use the same interface of fit and predict methods. So it would be exactly the same. Now, obviously you'll want to specify parameters. So we have default parameters for almost all models such that you can use them in this way. But if you want to specify parameters, um, you can. You just specify them at creation. So here, for example, uh, you can pass the value of theta, the seasonality, all that stuff. And this will depend on the model, obviously, the parameters you have. Then you will use it exactly the same way. So that's it. That's how simple it is to forecast, to make a simple forecast with art. Now, in practice, if you have multiple forecasts, you will want to compare them, right? You will want to know, was actually this forecast better than this forecast, or was it the other way around? And for this, we also have all of it built in in darts, and you'll be using metrics. So to compare a forecast to a time series uh, reference, you'll use metrics. And again, we have implemented them a lot. So there are tens of metrics to, to measure that. Uh, we have implemented the most common ones, so you just have to import them, and it's a simple call. You'll get a score. Coming back to this example, if we compute the MAPE score, so mean average percentage error, which is not perfect. It has its problems, but we'll be using this throughout the presentation. Uh, as you see, it's lower on the right than on the left, and since it's, a, since it's an error score, it means that the forecast on the right is better, according to MAPE at least. And yeah, so that's it for comparing a simple forecast. Now, in practice, you'll have different models. And what you really want to do is measure how accurate, how performant a model is. And for this, we provide historical forecasts and we provide backtests. So I'll be presenting both. But the idea is basically similar to how a model would have performed if it had been used historically. So it gives you either forecast or score that represents how good it performs. Starting with historical forecasts, uh, the idea behind it, you'll see the signature of the method right after that. But the idea is if this represents the whole timeline, the whole time index of your time series, historical forecast is going to make repeated calls, repeated train test splits, and it's going to use, so you pass it the start parameter a stride parameter and a forecast horizon parameter. And it's going to make the first cut at start 
and it's going to use all that comes before to train the model and it's going to forecast forecast horizon points into the future and this is going to give you a forecast that is this long and then it's going to jump stride time steps into the future and perform exactly the same train on all of this and make a forecast this this much into the future and so on and so on so what historical forecast returns is a list of forecasts one for each of those basically uh, the call looks like this so as i said you take your model call historical forecast give it the give it the series give it where you want to start here it can be a ratio as well so 0.5 would mean that you start in the middle um, of your time series at 50 percent you give it the forecast horizon the stride parameter and then there's this last point only parameter that i'll address it uh, in a couple slides you'll see what it means but what real matters here is you get a lot of forecasts and they're not really usable as is you, you're going to look at them in in the form of a plot and know whether it performs well or not so you have these those forecasts but you can actually you can actually use them to compute scores and this is what backtests allows you to do so backtesting built on top of historical forecasts so this is why they'll have pretty much the same parameters with some more for backtest and they're going to be they're going to give you the ability to look at those forecasts in terms of scores in terms of error scores so backtest here takes the same parameters and also takes a metric so which metric do you want to use to compute the error between each individual historical forecast and the reference time series and it's going to take a reduction parameter as well that i'll talk about just in a minute but it returns a list so if historical rec forecast returns a list of forecasts this simply returns computes the error for each one of those forecasts and returns a list of errors if you plot them using for example a histogram you can look at them this way and have an idea of how your model performed over time uh, how the errors were distributed but maybe maybe having this on the right is still a little too too much detail for you maybe you just want to have an idea just a single score of how well my model performed maybe just knowing the mean error is enough and for that the reduction parameter can be used so passing a reduction function that th this function is basically used to reduce to aggregate those um those backtest errors so if you pass for example numpy mean it's going to take all of those forecasts and compute the mean and this time backtest is going to return just a mean error so in this example you'll get mean error is going to be worth something like 2.0 something and that's it for backtesting now coming back to the last points only parameter this parameter is here because sometimes it might make sense to only look at the last points of your forecast so basically if you only care about what's happening at the end of your forecasting horizon then you might want to use the last points only parameter to assess the performance of your model one example could be if you're forecasting something three months into the future to make a purchase now well you don't really care how accurate you are after one month or two months you really want to know how accurate it is at the three month forecasting horizon and so passing last points only equal true means you'll still generate all those forecasts but you'll only remember the last points of each and since now since in this case um the points are not overlapping so you only have a point you won't ever have two points uh with the same timestamp. we simply return a single time series uh with all those points in it so you can also plot it but keep in mind that here on the right the the blue line is made up of only the last points uh in each of your individual historical forecast so that can be useful and obviously if you have the last points only parameter into historical forecast you can also use it with backtest and that's a big overview of uh, how you can evaluate models using Dart. So it might seem like a lot, but it's actually very handy and works very nicely uh, in practice. Then 
once you're able to evaluate models to compare them, you, might, you will want to find the actual best parameters you can use for a model, right? Comparing them and getting an error score is cool, but now that you compare them, you can use this information. And for this, we provide grid search, as I said earlier. And grid search functions basically exactly as you would expect it, I'd say. Uh, you give it a dictionary of parameters. So basically, you can specify any parameter that your model takes in its constructor. You can specify it in this dictionary. So here for the theta model, we, maybe we can use, we, can, we want to try a couple values for theta, and we want to try a different uh, seasonality mode. So it could be either a multiplicative seasonality or an additive one. And then you'll call grid search. So keep in mind, this is a class method. So you call it with theta.grid search, give it the parameters di dictionary, and then all of those should be familiar. They come from the backtest method, since under the hood, uh, grid search is gonna use backtest to get error scores and then take the best one uh, out of those. And grid search is gonna return a model that is not trained. It basically builds your model with the best parameters it found, and you get it in best model. So then you can use, it's a simple forecasting model, right? So you can use it in just the right way. You call fit to train and you call uh, predict to make a forecast. Looking at our example of theta, so on the left you have theta with a theta equals two and seasonality multiplicative. This is the default model we have um, created in the past. And on the right you have the result of grid search so keep in mind, when we grid search, we grid search on the training series. So right here, we grid search on the training series. And still, we can see here, it was beneficial to grid search because when we look at the validation uh, set and the forecast we made, uh, the best model we grid search for uh, achieved better MAPES results. And I guess that's it. That's it on my side. Uh, so time series, forecasting, evaluating, and tuning. And Francesco will present you in some way. Back to you. Yeah, thanks, Leo. Um, so just to recap really quickly, up until this point, we've looked at how to instantiate forecasting models, how to produce forecasts with those models, and different ways of evaluating the performance of these forecasting methods. And we kind of did all of this with the goal of finding the one model that gives us the best forecast. And so far, we have created two, of such, two such models, which is theta, whose parameter we found using grid search. And the second one is exponential smoothing. And between these two, theta is performing better. So we would pick that one as a winner. And if we had to produce a forecast, we would do it using the theta model. And of course, at this point, we could simply explore many more models with the hope of finding another one that outperforms the current winner. And there are many other darts forecasting models we could try out. In other words, you know, just to simply uh, continue the search for better forecasting models uh, would be a completely legitimate strategy. But there is actually another way of improving upon our current models, and that is assembly. So the idea behind assembly is that instead of just picking the best performing model using our evaluation tools and discarding the others, we could combine the strengths of multiple models uh, with the goal of canceling out their weaknesses. So Ensembling tries to achieve this by combining forecasts uh, of different forecasting models in a smart way. So the hope here is that some combination of the two forecasts will be better than either forecast by itself. And to illustrate how this could work, uh, let's start with a very simple uh, example. So, oh yeah, just to show here, you know, the goal is the assembling model being the winner overall. Okay, so a very uh, simple thing we could do is uh, we could simply take the average of our two forecasts. Uh, in this case, this means adding the theta and exponential smoothing forecast and dividing the resulting time series by two. And this actually gives us a combined forecast that is better than exponential smoothing, but not yet better than theta. 
So taking the average is equivalent to multiplying both forecasts with one half and adding them together. Of course, we're not constrained to these specific coefficients and they are in no way guaranteed to be optimal. So we could try all kinds of combinations. Um, for instance, uh, you know, you might want to give theta more weight since it's more accurate, or you could even subtract one forecast from a multiple of the other. The point is, you can go crazy since clearly the number of possibilities here is infinite. Uh, so the best thing would be to not guess these parameters, but to learn them. And that's exactly what the default darts assembling model can do for us. So an assembling model in darts consists of two main components. One is a list of forecasting models whose forecasts we want to combine to get a better one. So in this case, we have two models, theta and exponential smoothing. And the second part of the assembling model is the regression model that figures out how exactly the forecasts should be combined to obtain the best result. So, um, oh, let's wait with this. So actually, um, in the case of linear regression, this is the same as determining the two coefficients that we looked at in the previous slide. But actually, the DARTS assembling model accepts any kind of scikit-learn regression model at this point without constraints. So uh, for the purposes of, of this presentation, we're actually going to use the scikit-learn rich regression implementation, as you will see in a couple of slides. But just keep in mind, you can use any regression model here. But since we're using linear regression, this corresponds to what you saw before. Uh, uh, in terms of finding out these two coefficients for our two forecasts. So let's look at how these components work together to create one final combined forecast. So for this, uh, we consider the same training and validation series from before, um, but actually for now, let's just look at the training series. So the assembling model actually splits um, the training series into two parts. The point at which this split is made is decided by a parameter that is taken by the assembling model called regression train endpoints. And the naming of this should become clear uh, quite soon. So the first step of actually training our assembling model deals with the forecasting part. It involves training all forecasting models on the reduced training series. So the reduced training series basically corresponds to the left part of the training series, as is uh, indicated here in purple. And then uh, for every fitted model, uh, which in this example are the two, theta and exponential smoothing, um, the next regression train endpoints are predicted, uh, which corresponds to the right half of the training series. So you can see those predictions uh, in yellow on the graph. Now the next thing, um, the next step of training the assembling model deals with the regression model. And so, if we look at the right half of our training series, we can see that we have two types of time series for that time period at this point. We have the first, which is the ground truth time series. We have had from the start, which is shown in black. Uh, the second type consists of all the forecasts that we obtained in the previous step, uh, which are shown in yellow. Uh, so basically what we do with the regression model is we train it to predict the ground truth time series in black from the predicted time series from the previous step in yellow. Uh, and one data point uh, here just corresponds to one single point in time. So in other words, uh, we train the regression model to predict the same predicted time series in black from all the time series in yellow, uh, which are the predictions. So in total, we have regression train endpoints, uh, data points to train the model with. Now the final step of training involves the forecasting models again and in this step we simply train all of our forecasting models on the whole training series so not just the left part so just to summarize after training uh, we have multiple trained constituent models so for one we have all forecasting models uh, that are now trained on the whole training series and uh, we have the regression model that is trained to predict our actual time series from the predictions in yellow obtained by forecasting the last regression train endpoints of the training series. So how does this setup allow us to now make a prediction into the future using the ensemble model? 
So now that the model is fully fitted, let's look at how these building blocks create the prediction. So this is done in two steps. And the first one again involves uh, the forecasting model. So we basically just let them predict the next points uh, in the forecasting horizon like we would normally do. And we do this for all forecasting models. So this gives us again to forecast for, but this time for the validation period. So this time we're actually predicting into the future and not inside our training series. And these predictions are again shown in yellow. So the next step um, is done by the regression model. And basically what it does is for every point in time, the model takes all the forecasts in yellow from the previous step. And uh, using those as an input, it produces the final ensembled forecast as output, which you can see here in red. So this is our final ensembling output. So I hope the explanation I just gave you of how DART's uh, regression assembling works was not too convoluted, but if it was, I have good news for you. Uh, you don't really have to bother too much about how exactly it works if you don't care. So it can be used just like any other forecasting model. The only difference is that you have to provide a few parameters uh, in addition to other uh, forecasting models when constructing it. So here you can see the code that instantiates an assembling model. Uh, you can see that we have to provide it with three parameters. One is the list of forecasting models. Uh, the second is the regression training points parameter you saw before that determines how many points we train our regression model on. And finally, the regression model itself. So actually, you can also leave that blank and it will just use linear regression. But here we actually use um, a ridge regression implementation from scikit-learn. Um, but again, you can use anything. You can use MLPs too if you want, you know, if you want to use something super complex. But of course, you know, you have to deal with the issue of overfitting at this point. Um, so after having instantiated our assembling model, we can fit it and produce predictions exactly like we would for normal forecasting models, as you can see here. So if we actually run this coin, uh, this code, uh, we get a prediction that actually beats both theta and exponential smoothing model predictions uh, from before, as you can see here. Okay, and actually, in fact, um, I said assembly model behaves like a forecasting model, but that's actually not all. It actually inherits from the same superclass as all the other forecasting models as well. So this means that all functionalities we discussed before, uh, such as historical forecasts and backtesting, also can be used with assembling models. And if you want, you can also use assembling models inside assembling models, uh, although I'm not sure if that may be, uh, you know, overdoing it. But the point here is, uh, you know, everything that we discussed before, it will also work for assembling model. Okay, so now finally, let's talk uh, let's let's see one last step of how we can improve our forecast, which is using data processing. So just as a quick intro to data processing, if we take a look at the y-axis of our time series we've used so far, uh, we can see that the range of values is between 500 and 1,000. So one very common transformation in uh, machine learning is to scale the data to a range between 0 and 1. And in darts, um, we can use the scalar class to perform this transformation. And so we can we can very easily transform the series. And we can also fit and transform uh, in one line. So this is very similar to how you would do it in scikit-learn. And we can actually use the same data transformer object again to get back to the original series. Uh, if the data transformer is invertible. So DART has many different kinds of data transformers. And um, so what's the point of that, you may ask? Well, imagine you first rescale a series to have uh, values between zero and one, and then you create a forecast. Well, your forecast will be in a new range that doesn't necessarily make sense. Uh, you know, for instance, if you forecast sales and then all your um, fail forecast will be between zero and one. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So to get back to the original range, we need to inverse transform your forecast. And you will see an example of that shortly. And actually in Dart, just quick, um, just uh, to mention this really quick, you can also chain together multiple transformers 
uh, to perform many transformations in one go. And uh, this can be achieved using our pipeline object uh, class. So if you want to learn more about that, please check out, check out our documentation. Um, but for this example, one transformer will actually be enough. So, uh, but the question is, what kind of transformer is actually going to help us here? So to get the answer to that, let's consider again what data we are dealing with, which is total milk production during every month. Now, the problem with monthly data is that months have different numbers of days. So this means that some fluctuations in our data may not actually be due to different amounts of milk produced, but actually uh, because of the fact that different months have different lengths. So to account for this confounding variable, you could say, uh, we'd like to go from monthly total milk production to average daily milk production per month. And how do we do this? So luckily, Darts provides exactly the right functionality for this in form of the invertible mapper class. So for the invertible mapper class, we need to define both the forward and the backward function that should be performed element-wise as a function of timestamp and value for every point in the time series. And you can see that in this case, the forward function simply divides every value by the number of days in the given month whereas the inverse function does the opposite. And to create the appropriate data transformer, we simply instantiate the invertible mapper class of darts with the two functions, and we apply it to our series, and voila. So you can see, you know, it, it already looks like a much simpler series, but now let's look at um, how the models we have developed so far actually perform on this uh, newly transformed series. And well, here are the performances of our previous models, and all of them actually perform significantly better, but exponential smoothing is now outperforming the others. So uh, even though assembling one on the original uh, time series, exponential smoothing now does the best on the transformed one. So in this case, we will choose exponential smoothing as our final winner. Uh, but of course, uh, what I mentioned before applies here too. Our original time series has a different unit than the forecast you see here. So we need to transform our forecast back into the old unit. And um, so this is actually quite easy. Um, we can simply take our invertible mapper object from before and apply the inverse transform on our forecast. And so since each forecast and ground truth value are scaled back the same way, our mean average percentage error will not change. And thus, exponential smoothing will stay the winner. And with this, um, we have achieved the accuracy we set out to achieve at the start of this section. So I really hope you've gotten a sense of all the different functionality STARS provides to create different forecasts and to find the procedure uh, that works best for your time series data. So of course, um, there's many other functionalities that Darts includes too. You know, we, we don't have to time to go over all of them, especially um, kind of in the area of forecasting models. We also have a deep learning uh, framework for forecasting uh, where we have a bunch of models that can be very powerful on certain time series. So I really encourage you to check out our uh, GitHub repository and their example notebooks. Um, but yeah, so this is kind of uh, the end of our presentation. Now for some last words, uh, let me give the mic back to Leo um, to talk about what comes next. Thanks. So this will be short as we're running short actually a little bit, but what's next? So we have plans to further develop this uh, this time series forecasting library. The first is we want to have a better API, a better interface to interact with our library in the non-univariate cases. So we've only been showing a univariate time series, but in the non-univariate time series, uh, we want to be able to very simply deal with multivariate time series and in particular differentiate between uh, the actual variable or variables you're trying to predict to forecast and the external or covariate data that you have that can help you make this prediction. 
So for example, if you're trying to predict, forecast the energy production, as Francesco said, you'll be looking at all things like holidays, because obviously when people are holiday, there's maybe, depending on the location, less or more uh, energy consumption, the weather, the all that kind of stuff. Those are covariates, for example. The other way we want to uh, better this API is through implementing training on multiple time series. So maybe you have a time series that you've recorded, I don't know, every, I mean, you have multiple instances and you want to train on all of them and use all of this information to make a forecast. This is not supported out of the box by darts right now, and we want to provide a very easy way to do it. Uh, another thing is anomaly detection. This is something we've seen in actual practical business cases. This is something uh, we really have use of. And animal detection, the idea is basically because you learn how the time series uh, behaves by fitting your models, you would want to be able to see when your sensors or whatever do actually uh, read something that is out of the ordinary, you want to be able to flag this. So this is something that is linked to the next point, that's probabilistic modeling. Uh, as of right now, we only have models that produce point estimates. So you only have a value. And we would love to have probabilistic modeling. So basically have confidence intervals, for example, for your prediction. Know how, how well, basically an interval instead of having a point prediction. So that would be one that we'll currently have. And the web app Francesco was mentioning, we are doing some work on this side too. Uh, might not go uh, live very soon though, but this is something we wanna provide basically to make time series forecasting super simple uh, and accessible to non-technical profiles. So the idea is to that you would have your uh, Excel CSV files, drag and drop them into the web app and perform some simple analysis on them um, without having to write actual Python code. And that's it. So resources, this presentation with Francesco uh, will be made available on our YouTube channel. So check that out if you've missed some parts or you want to see, uh, see it again. The repository, the repository on GitHub is available at all times. The master branch is the actual uh, code that we have currently um, released. If you want to see the new stuff we're working on, it's going to be merged on develop or even newer stuff is going to be in open PR. And uh, a good resource online, if you want to learn more about time series forecasting in general, is going to be forecasting principles and practice. Uh, it's free, it's online, it's very good. It's by some of the guys who've worked on uh, implementing a lot of time series forecasting in R. So check this out if you're interested. This, uh, just a quick word, um, we're also, we also have a group on Meetup uh, for talks about AI, ML analytics. So if you want to hear more, uh, just join, keep in touch, and we'll have further talks down the line. And Leo, Francesco, there, there are actually a few questions in the, uh, the Q&A panel. Um, let me know if you prefer to, for me to read them or if you can uh, access them directly. Um, I so I've never done this before, so maybe if if it's no, uh, sure. you know, it's not yeah, trouble. So a, if you can read them. Sure. So there's a question from uh, Not Bad to asking, uh, how do you extract, visualize the predicted values as a table, like CVS or Excel, or or a list? Okay, I can probably do that. So. Uh, not sure if you mean about extracting them to CSV, Excel files, or in Python, use the data. Uh, in Python, as I said, under we use time series object and the time series abstraction everywhere, but under the hood, it's a data frame, so you can access it. It's a private field, so underscore dot df, uh, under, dot underscore df gives you the data frame right away. You can also copy it. Uh, we have methods for that, so you could, we call pandas data frame. You get the data frame back and once you have the data frame you can export it just like you would any data frame so uh, pandas has you can export it to csv you can uh serialize it in some way you can pickle it that's uh your choice basically 
on no but to let us know if, if that uh, answers your question and sure, yeah. there's uh, there's another one uh, i guess a little bit more generic and uh, francesco you touched upon it at the beginning of the session but uh, but uh, Plamen is curious on what problems do you apply the time series forecasting on? If you could uh, give a few examples of, of our work. So uh, work at unit eight. Um, or overall, so the, you know, overall. How would you, what, what would be the problems that darts could uh, uh, address, I guess? Yes, business use cases. So. Uh, I'm not sure if you were uh, there for kind of the first uh, slide that I where I introduced, you know, a couple of kind of, you know, very simple use cases in business. Uh, one was energy production and the other one was uh, a car manufacturer. So, for example, could be forecasting demand for energy, but you could imagine it could be forecasting the demand for anything. You know, I mean, you could be you could be a store selling flowers and you don't want to. You know, you don't want to do all the work in uh, kind of obtaining too many flowers if people are not going to buy them. And at the same time, you don't want to have, um, you know, too little flowers to sell like on um, Valentine's Day. I mean, of course, you don't need a forecasting model to know that you should have a lot of flowers on Valentine's Day. But like the point is, any time where, you know, you need to do some preparation uh, in the past uh, for an event in the future that is kind of... Um, you know, which is kind of numerically defined, such as, you know, such as, oh, you know, uh, in March, more people are going to buy flowers, so I should have my, more flowers ready. Um, and again, you know, you could be a car manufacturer, you could uh, produce any kind of thing. So I think um, that's a very intuitive way or like a very common example of uh, the use of forecast. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Francesco. Uh, Plamen, let us know if, if this gives you enough. If not, uh, feel free to engage us after the uh, after the session. Um, and there's one more uh, from Eileen. What is or what are the main advantages of using darts in comparison to stats models or uh, SK Learn? Skits Learn. Um, so. I mean, oh, okay, I can start on this and Leo, you can add on top of that if you want. Uh, so for example, stats model. So I have to uh, say in advance, I'm no expert on all the things that that library includes, but um, what darts really provides, we actually wrap models for stats models too. So actually, if you use darts exponential smoothing in the back, use stats models. So then you might ask, oh, why don't you just use stats models instead, right? Oh, well, the, the um, advantage of using darts is that on top of th those stats models, you have all kinds of other um, forecasting models. And the advantage of having them all together in one ecosystem is that you can very easily um, compare them, compare the results, and really choose the one model that fits your data best. So that's really the advantage of darts is that we, we aggregate many, many models in a, in a coherent framework. And um, in terms of oh, why not just use sklearn? Well, sklearn, um, so the interface of sklearn in terms of fit and predict, it does not take into consideration um, the temporal structure of data. So you have different data points and different labels and you try to predict labels from data points or from features of these data points but the sklearn models do not take into consideration that one data point comes uh, after the other. So we really try to offer models that do, in fact, um, kind of incorporate this information. I hope um, that makes sense to you. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, feel free to uh, to let us know if there's. Uh, uh, oh yeah, we we got the uh, thank you note. Perfect. And the last one that we can probably uh, squeeze in before the uh, end the session comes from Sumit. In the slide where the exponential smoothing model performed better than the uh, ensembling model with uh, exponential smoothing and theta, were these models trained on data pre-transformation on data pre-transformation data? Um, yeah, good question. Um, no, no, they were actually fitted using the newly um, transformed series. Um, because otherwise they would have just predicted the same as before. But it's a good question. Yes, we 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 trained them using the newly transformed data as well. Uh, and Sumit, let us know if that uh, if that answers your question. 
Uh, I'm not seeing any any new questions, so I think uh, it will be the time to to wrap up. Uh, once again, a uh, big thank you to to Francesco and uh, and Leo for for hosting us today. Uh, in the chat panel, you see the links to the uh, to the Darts repository, to to an article that was written about uh, about Darts. Feel free to leverage. As mentioned, uh, this uh, this webinar will be also available on our YouTube channel. The link is in the uh, in the chat box. Uh, with that, thank you for joining. Uh, Unit Eight talks will uh, will come back in uh, in January with some fresh content. Thanks a lot for tuning in, Francesco. Thanks a lot for uh, for driving the session. Thanks. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Thanks. You're welcome.